Thanks, Mark, for such a warm welcome. I, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Ngunnawal, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I am so delighted to be here at IATSIS today to celebrate World Digital Preservation Day and to share with you a bit about the Australasia Preserves Digital Preservation Community of Practice. If you use Twitter, just quickly, um, on the slide here, there's a couple of hashtags that we use. The OzPreserves hashtag is our standard hashtag that we use for Australasia Preserves and the WDPD 2018. We'll be showcasing 24 hours in the life of the digital preservation community globally. Uh, we're lucky enough to be kicking it off today in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, except for New Zealand, who started a couple of hours ago. So, you know, not quite the first. So the first thing you should know about both Australasia Preserves and World Digital Preservation Day is that they provide really wonderful opportunities to celebrate with baked goods. So what I'm showing you here is a CD cake, and these are actually floppy disk cookies. They were made by our very talented uh, colleague, Kirsten Wright, uh, to celebrate our very first Australasia Preserves meetup, which was back in February. This year, she's kind of outdone herself. This is her creation for World Digital Preservation Day. She's created, as you can see on the right, this is a cake that is pretty much an exact replication of a digital curation life cycle model. It has rainbow colors on the inside. It tasted delicious, it's all eaten. And she also did some digital preservation workflow cookies down the bottom, which meant that everyone had to educationally build their own digital preservation workflow before they were allowed to eat the cookies. So educational and borderline nutritious. <laughs> So just a quick, very quick overview of the Australasia Preserves digital preservation community of practice for those people new to it. It's been going for almost a year now. Uh, it takes its main form in an active online group forum where anyone with an interest in digital preservation is welcome to join. It aims to be a place to share expertise, knowledge, to share job opportunities that come up to share events of interest to the community. And it's also, it, it's also a place where people can explore opportunities for collaboration. The University of Melbourne has devoted some time and some resources during this year to hosting uh, monthly online meetups. So we've been doing those, they go for about an hour each month. And we have different topics and different speakers um, contribute to that from both Australia and New Zealand. Also, they're not just online. A couple of times this year for these monthly meetups, a couple of organizations have stepped up to host local events. So thanks to IATSIS and Arnet, we're here today and we've got the live stream. Back in July, we also had the State Library of New South Wales who hosted a local event. They had a whole heap of lightning talks and a really engaging panel that explored the differences between digitization and digital preservation. And I have a link on the slide here to all of the presentations they recorded and live streamed for you to check out. So it is a very welcoming community. It's very grassroots and it is growing. So we encourage the organization of local events like this one as well, because it gives us a chance to be here, to meet, to talk, to meet in person, to share the work we're doing in digital preservation, to talk about challenges and issues and to build a connection. So we hope that new connections are made today and that they continue through the online group forum. Thanks. The uh, agenda allows for uh, a panel discussion at the end, and that's after the basic presentations. But if there's someone who has burning questions, just push your hand up and, start and speak out. Uh, we do have some wonderful people that have microphones that will come to you if you need to speak uh, and they'll be strategically placed around the room. Um, the next speaker is Gerald Priest, uh, who is currently the Manager of Preservation and uh, Digitalisation of Audiovisual Media at IATSIS. He's pre previously managed the print and photographic digitization projects and has worked at various roles in the federal government, cultural heritage institutions and across the tertiary sector. 
Gerald will outline AATIS's digitisation work to date and um, touch on some of the future directions in the digital preservation space. Please welcome Gerald. Thanks, Mark. I'll just get myself set up here. And I'll start my timer, so I stay on time. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past and present. And I'd particularly like to thank everyone for coming out today. And I hope this is um, a, a building and developing thing in Canberra because uh, one thing I've learned over the 20 odd years I've been involved in digitization and digital preservation is that uh, it's not an easy business and it keeps changing. So there is a great need for a community of practice and that we share and support one another in continuing to develop that. Um, as Mark said, sorry about that. Um, oops. I'm going to give a bit of an overview uh, not about digital preservation, but about the work on digitization that's happened at IATSIS over approximately the last 18 or so years. Um, uh, I've, I've been involved with it across that period of time. And um, I, what I would really like to do is um, share some of our experiences and some of our learnings and um, uh, possibly hope that that's a a useful guide for, for, for some of you because uh, I'm sure there's a variety of levels of experience in the room and I can assure you that um, it hasn't always been plain sailing and that there is plenty of lessons we've learned along the way. Um, the, the view I take of our digitization program is that it, it is about uh, a digitization process leading to a digital preservation process but they are both about ensuring future access of content. Um, that's, that's what it's all about, that the, the value of a collection uh, is primarily in the degree to which it's available and usable to those uh, of, you know, who have appropriate access to that material. And that's a an particularly important issue at IATSIS, uh, where over many years, a substantial collection of material has been collected and created um, but it hasn't always been available to remote and regional Indigenous communities. And, and that's something that um, is uh, a, a focus of what IATSIS tries to do in preserving its collections and making them available. So um, a bit of a summary. Um, our collections, as I said, they've, they've been acquired over quite a number of years. The IATSIS, uh, IATSIS has approximately a 50 year history and um, many of its collections have been created in that uh, time, but also many of them predate that and have been offered here um, pro uh, after that, after the commencement of the Institute. Uh, basically though, as you see there, it's quite an extensive and diverse collection, uh, far more extensive than, than many people know. <laughs> and um, it's also quite diverse in the range of formats represented. Uh, I won't recite the numbers there, but I might pick out a few details um, and say a little bit about them. Uh, the audio material, um, we're lucky in that it's mostly limited to cassette and open reel. Um, so we're, we're limited in the number of formats that we have to deal with. Um, and a lot of that has been the product of former research projects um, where say for example, language elicitations by linguists have been collected, uh, oral histories, uh, all manner of uh, ethnomusicological recordings have been made and um, th they're, as I said, mainly on cassette and open reel. Um, we're very fortunate to have digitised about 83% of that collection, so we've really made some substantial progress there. Um, moving down the line, uh, as you can see, the moving image collection is quite diverse and even within that, our video collection in particular, uh, as some of you I'm sure know, there are a great diversity of formats available in video from analog through to digital. 
and we've probably got about uh, 20 or so different formats represented in our collection and um, generally speaking it requires a, a similar number of playback equipment units um, or types of units to cover that. Um, Photographic, uh, again, a diversity of, of formats there and a very extensive collection. And the print material, I've really singled out the uh, manuscripts there because uh, many of them are unpublished and many of them are, uh, by their very nature, unique. So in a sense, they do represent um, some of the gems of the collection in that they're not held or available elsewhere. Uh, they're part of the the IATSIS collection and indeed have been created as part of its research over, over many years. As you'll see at the bottom, um, we've also got a growing art and object collection and a range of other sorts of um, electronic and ephemera type media. Our digitisation um, over the past number of years has mainly uh, focused on ensuring that the collection we have um, ha is is preserved in a digital form so that it is then suitably accessible on into the future. Um, as, as again, as I'm sure some of you know, the difficulties there are, particularly with audio and video material, that the ferromagnetic tape uh, is subject to its own inherent breakdown due to the age, how many times it's been played back, how well or poorly it has been stored, Indeed, even the original quality of the, the manufacture of the tape, there, there are known to be varieties within that, and some of them have got a greater degree of longevity than others. So um, those are some of the issues we're, we're faced uh, with in, in dealing with digitising those materials. Um, variety of images there of some of the known uh, breakdown. Uh, top right-hand corner, you've got sticky shed syndrome, where the... Uh, signal carrying material basically just flakes off the substrate of the tape, um, mouldy tape uh, and the image with the yellow centre and the bottom left hand corner are both uh, forms of vinegar syndrome which affects film based materials whether they're photographic film or motion picture film again it's due to the nature of the materials from which they're made the cellulose acetate um, subject to usually it's uh, cyclic temperature and humidity uh, fluctuations in that can bring on the um, vin vinegar syndrome which cause the emulsion layer to buckle and in some cases flake off the idea being that through better storage you avoid that getting it to that point um, and are able to digitize the content before that happens um, i've also put in a, a couple of images of um, some machines uh, and I've put those there for a reason in that um, on the left or the, the one in the centre is a, a, a Nagra, which is a, 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 a micro uh, audio recording unit, um, was uh, sort of a, a, a covert recording device in the sense, but it became very handy for field workers because it was so light and portable. So it's ideally suited to doing field recordings, whether it's just for audio material or as a, a part of a, a film production. Um, th those units are very well made. We have one, uh, not a lot of other people do. And uh, so if you have content that's on that Nagra format and you don't have a working playback unit, you're in trouble. <laughs> And uh, fortunately, uh, we do have one, ours does work. We have digitised our Nagra format and other people come to us uh, to, to seek out a, a suitable playback unit. On the right, the bottom right-hand corner is a Sony J format, which is an early form of open reel video. And it's, um, again, uh, an early machine, difficult to find in, uh, in, in working condition. I think we've got one of the few working units in Canberra. So we've been able to digitize uh, most of our Sony J format and, uh, and indeed have also done similar sort of work for that for other people. The reason why I'm putting all of those things on one page is, is because they're clearly related. Your, your ability to digitize material is related to the condition of the material and the availability of the playback equipment. The third factor which I haven't uh, addressed there is, is also um, 
having the requisite expertise to maintain and preserve, uh, maintain and keep in good working order your equipment. And uh, again, we're once for, we are fortunate to have a uh, uh, an engineer on site who can repair and maintain that equipment for us, so that we are able to digitise content. What that um, brings also into the picture, though, is if you've got a uh, extensive collection like we do, uh, obviously you can't digitise it all at once. There needs to be a, a matrix of decisions made about how and why you choose to prioritise different formats. And clearly the preservation factors are one, uh, but it's not the only factor. Um, there is, uh, these are the four basic um, assessments that we make in guiding the allocation of resources to our prioritisation. The first one being um, the significance of the collection item. Obviously, collection, collecting organisations uh, do their best to assess material that's offered to them for deposit to their collection. Um, you're not going to collect things that uh, are not related to your collection focus. Um, you're going to try and pick the best examples of what is, what is offered to you. And as I'm sure some of you are aware, the Significance 2.0 assessment process is a, a guideline to how materials are assessed so that you're assessing materials for, for gaining, uh, for putting into your collection, but also for, um, in terms of deciding whether or not it's a high priority candidate for digitization. Uh, I've spoken about the, the trifecta of issues that relate to the, the preservation drivers. The other two remaining drivers relate to the level of access. Um, so there's two aspects to that. One is that we do know from our client services area that there are particular forms of content that are of high interest to access clients. And over quite a number of years, we've developed um, information on um, what those items are and so added that to our prioritisation mm -hmm. matrix about choosing things for digitisation. The other one is opportunistic drivers in that there might be a, uh, say for example, a significant anniversary of a particular event that you know full well that there will be uh, demand on the collection to provide digital versions of those and so that forms the sort of fourth major driver of uh, prioritisation. Uh, the optimal path obviously is clearly a balance of all of those things. Um, it's often not a, um, an easy decision making process to make, um, but uh, trying to navigate a line weighing up those, those sort of four major factors is something that we've tried to do uh, I'm not going to read through that. I'll let people read through that while I'm talking. But what I've tried to set out here, it looks complex, but it's actually not all that complex. Um, good digitisation, which provides a suitable digitised collection item, which is suitable for digital preservation and suitable for most forms of future access, it's all about process control. Uh, it's a bit like baking a cake. If you want a nice cake, you choose the best ingredients, you follow the recipe, you prepare the ingredients in the right sequence for the right time, for the right temperature, you come up with a nice cake. If you don't get quite that balance right, things don't turn out as well as you'd like them to. And that's basically the same with digitization. It's a very simple analogy, but the, the point is the same. I'll run through some of the points that I've grouped there though. Um, obviously you're going to choose the, the earliest generation of, equip, of uh, content that you can find. Uh, there is little point to digitizing something that is a third or fourth generation, unless that's all that you've got remaining. If that's the case, well then you work with what you've got. But if the opportunity arises to get back to an original generation, you'll go to that because that will have the best level of content available within it. Um, once those items are part of your collection, you're going to quarantine them so that if they have 
mold or early onset vinegar syndrome or something like that, they are not going to affect other collection items and promul promulgate that condition in those materials. Uh, your conductor condition assessment, you might do some um, introductory rehousing to try and stabilise those materials and you'll also um, possibly even buy yourself time with, say, for example, film materials. You might, uh, you can actually deep freeze some film if it's got the signs through an acid detection strip of showing vinegar syndrome deterioration. You can shrink wrap it and deep freeze it and you'll buy yourself quite a substantial amount of time before you have to digitise it which can allow you time to focus on more critical priorities. Uh, at IATSIS, we do a fair amount of work on the preparation of materials. Uh, our materials that require it are stored in appropriate temperature and humidity control vaults. Um, prior to digitization, we might do things like tape baking, um, film repair of splices, film cleaning, the, the picture of the gigantic fridge looking item is our ultrasonic film cleaner. So every film gets cleaned before it's digitised. Uh, we also um, have a routine and scheduled maintenance of many, many of our parts of equipment, pieces of equipment, sorry, to try and ensure that they maintain stable operating conditions within the param expected parameters for that type of piece of equipment. What that means is that you get a good quality digital output. The other thing about it is uh, digitization environment. Um, in some, obviously things like uh, uh, you know, clean and dust free, but in, in some uh, areas you might want to have, uh, so for example, a, a neutral gray facility so that if you have to do any color correction, you're not being skewed by the colour temperature of the available lighting in the room. So that, again, the, the environment is, is part of the whole process control. And uh, you can see there, um, just uh, in the bottom picture, that's one of our scanning facilities where we have a, a, a whole raft of uh, Creo scanners for automated film scanning, uh, still image scanning, that is. A general principle that we apply is to digitise once to a suitable standard uh, and then repurpose many by the creation of uh, derivative files. Clearly you don't want to be double or triple handling material if you can avoid it. That affects the condition of the original item. So digitise once to a suitable standard, repurpose many. The um, uh, suitable standard is a bit of a movable feast. There are a great many standards out there developed by peak bodies that I'm sure many of you are aware of. Uh, I think what I would say rather than being prescriptive about standards, I would say that individual organisations and collections need to make informed decisions about what standard they choose to follow and why. If you've got, say for example, high quality materials that you intend to uh, be enabled to reproduce fully in a digital format, then clearly you're going to have to apply a fairly high standard of equipment and process management. If you only intend to provide, say for example, low res images on a large scale on a website, you're not necessarily going to need to apply that same level of stringent standard. And that means that you'll get a great, far greater level of throughput. Um, that's a question that people need to really resolve for themselves, um, bearing in mind all of the, the different pressures about rates of throughput, quality of output. Um, and that's the basic summary that, that the process, process control gives you quality assurance, produces files for suitable digital preservation and suitable for future access. The, the last thing I'll talk about on this page, the, Photograph up in the top right hand corner is our technical workshop, which we are very, very fortunate to have. We've had two engineers work here uh, over quite a number of years who have developed that facility because it wasn't here when we started. And uh, it, through careful selection and hunting down of uh, vintage equipment and repair uh, capabilities and spare parts, they're able to maintain 
most of our equipment within the expected operating parameters, which is not easy to do, I can assure you. Um, okay, the last uh, question in, uh, I'll say is something about our um, in-house digitization versus uh, outsourcing. On occasion, uh, we have availed ourselves of outsourcing. There are swings and roundabouts to whether you do something in-house or whether you outsource it. I've listed some of those um, factors there. The things to think about are that you, you need to uh, try and inform yourself as much as possible about what the actual service that is being provided by the outsource provider, have a clear contractual arrangement about what will be the expected product. Uh, and um, one of the advantages of outsourcing is that sometimes they might have, uh, as we've found, they'll have different equipment from what we have and they're able to bring uh, sometimes an economy of scale. And the, the uh, significant example there is that uh, IATSIS over a number of years has outsourced some printed matter digitization uh, where people have had, uh, outsourced providers have had automatic page turning book scanners, which is equipment that we don't have and don't necessarily want to acquire because our focus is on some of the uh, other equipment that we do retain in house. And uh, there are a number of, quite a number of suitable suppliers with that sort of equipment who can do that at quite a reasonable price point and quite a good quality factor. So significant example of that. Some years ago, IATSIS um, uh, arranged with the Courier Mail newspaper to digitise the entire back catalogue of the Courier Mail newspaper because that was an item that was in high demand. And um, that was done uh, down in Melbourne and um, I think out of the 37 and a half thousand pages that were digitized, I think there was something like um, 50 that needed to be redone. And um, so that was a substantial project and very well, very well done by people who uh, had appropriate equipment to do so. And it, it suited us to get through that volume quite rapidly. The things, to also consider is that um, uh, there might be additional resourcing to uh, needed at the end or on the return of the digital files for the quality checking of the site supplied work. You can't just assume that it's been done accurately in, in every regard. Uh, and sometimes it might be advantageous to have something like a, uh, an automatic, uh, automated Q system, QC system uh, and an automated uh, ingest to a digital asset management system uh, and the network and storage capacity to support that. Um, so again, there's, there's weighing up there, uh, pros and cons. Right. Now I'll just move on to last thing here. This is um, what I call an indicative environment. Uh, something that um, we've tried to work towards at IATSIS. Uh, it's, a, it's not a technical map or a, a network map, it's a conceptual model. And again, it's about trying to address the various needs to run a suitable digitization program and uh, address the various concepts. So on the left-hand side of the page there, you'll see the various digitization groups that we have uh, working in a, um, a steady state of a, of a local area <laughs> network uh, to a um, suitable local storage, which uh, what it does is it is enables them to have fast and ready access to suitable level of storage um, with, within a uh, a, a subnet or a VLAN, whichever phrase you term, prefer to use. And um, that uh, means that you, for example, can have things like a um, support, how should we say, legacy format operating systems. Some of you will be familiar with the, the Creo image scanners, which I showed a, a, a photograph of before, will be well aware that they run on legacy Mac systems. 
which uh, have their, all of their own issues. Uh, they need to be um, maintained as a legacy format to keep that equipment operating. So you can scan with those particular sets of scanners in the absence of other suitable technology at this point in time. And so maintaining legacy operating platforms uh, is often best done within a, uh, a subnet environment because it means that you minimise your risks to exposure to having out-of-date software, out-of-date operating systems on a broader organisational network. Um, you can have a... Uh, a secure firewall connecting you to the outside world, um, a, a cloud storage type arrangement, which many, many organisations are going towards. Uh, as part at point four there, you can have also have things like a external collection for uh, donors of material to your collection in digital format or outsource providers who are providing you with digitised content that could go directly to that. So th there's a couple of needs I'm trying to represent there that are just functional requirements. I'm not a network engineer, but I'm trying to show how the concepts that people might need to have met could be addressed. Right, I think I'm running out of time, so I'll summarise quickly. Um, I welcome you and encourage you to go and have a look at the IATSIS website. There's been a lot of work done on that recently and you'll see there's quite a range of online content that has been made available there. As I said at the very beginning, um, uh, IATSIS has prioritised content that uh, there has been a high demand for, uh, that is often um, sometimes unique in our collection and that also the other consideration for an organisation like IATSIS is that it's often material that might be in the public domain or there are not necessarily any restrictions about putting it on an open access website and so say for example the the Curry Mail newspaper, the Dawn magazine that we have online, the the mission journals, those are all published and they are accessible in many libraries. Although if you don't live in a town with a large library, you can't access those materials. And hence, knowing that they are often frequently requested, IATSIS has digitized those and put those online. There's a range of other websites from our collection materials. Uh, and there's actually probably twice that many. I've just listed some that I'm quite well familiar with. But please go and have a look at your leisure. Um, the last thing I would really like to say is that one other thing that IATSIS has done in uh, recent years, or quite often on, it's, it's sporadic, it depends upon our funding availability, but IATSIS has taken very much to heart the role about uh, trying to support uh, remote and regional Indigenous communities who have many collections of their own material, but may not have the resources or the expertise or the opportunity to preserve or digitise in the way that we do. So one of the models that IATSIS has operated uh, in conjunction with a number of communities and, and also um, other interested parties, uh, Professor Linda Norman Parker from the University of Melbourne is one, who's been able to establish relationships with communities for IATSIS. And two of those are um, the uh, CALAC, the Kimberley Aboriginal Law and Culture Centre and the Wadai community. And uh, they have extensive, extensive collections of, of analog format materials that they wanted to digitise and gain access to. And so IATSIS, those materials have been offered to IATSIS. IATSIS has digitised, returned the digital content to the communities. The communities are, in particularly what I, are previewing that material with a view to adding additional descriptive metadata. So that can go to build that collection and preserve it with the suitable added metadata. That's also, that sort of collaborative work has also been done by IATSIS in the form of technical training. Uh, IATSIS has collaborated with the National Film and Sound Archive uh, on the Indigenous Remote Archival Fellowship. 
uh, where um, communities of interest can apply to participate in a fellowship. They come to Canberra for a week or so training, some at National Film and Sound Archives, some here, and uh, learn skills so they, where possible, can work with their own collection materials on country. Uh, the last example that uh, hasn't happened for a while but may emerge again is that a similar sort of thing that IATSIS has done has delivered the Keeping the History Alive workshop, which is a more fully featured workshop for Indigenous communities about how to prepare, preserve, manage your own collection of material in your own keeping place on country. And that's a significant dimension that um, the digitisation team has been able to support over the past 15 or so years. Um, the last thing I'd really like to say is that um, uh, I can see a few of our technicians in the room and um, this work wouldn't happen without them. And um, so you know who you are. Thank you very much because uh, there has been, uh, IATSIS has a place that sort of flies under the radar a bit, but. Uh, there has been a great deal of work done and there has been a great deal of digitisation done here, uh, which is part of the step in the process to ensuring that these materials are preserved for future generations. Thank you all for your time and um, I'm happy to take any questions now or later. Uh, maybe later then. Jay Weatherburn is based at the University of Melbourne and is working to improve and support digital preservation capability. Now that's all she wanted me to say. Um, but let's just expand that a little bit and make her go slightly embarrassed. Uh, this uh, year she co-authored Preserving Digital Materials with Ross Harvey and she is a member of the Digital Preservation Coalition and a facilitator of Australia, uh, Australia blah, 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 put my mouth back together, Australasia Preserves. Now, Jay's going to speak to us about the importance of sustainable digital preservation and how collaboration and empowering new stakeholders can hopefully achieve this. And I suspect that we as IATSIS could count ourselves amongst those new stakeholders. And so we're going to be listening very carefully. So please welcome Jay. Thanks again for that lovely welcome, Mark. I, I, I often give short bios because I just, I just think if you're sitting there listening to a bio, you just kind of tune out. But that was, that was beautiful. Thank you very much for the welcome and introduction. So to expand on, on what I'll talk about today under this broad theme of digital preservation for everyone, uh, I'll start off by just talking a little about the importance of having a shared language for digital preservation. I'll talk briefly about why we need to preserve digital materials and what's needed for sustainable digital preservation. Uh, talk a little bit how, about how collaboration can help to improve digital preservation, especially for those facing a lack of resourcing. I will talk a little bit about how we can include new stakeholders in our efforts. And finally, just wrap up with a couple of um, useful things that I've found to get started with digital preservation. So a good starting point for doing anything with digital preservation is to define what you and all of your key stakeholders mean by it. So whatever your organizational context, um, defining terms and what you mean by them, it can go a long way towards promoting a shared language so that in turn that makes developing your strategies and your plans together a lot easier. There is a lot of terminology used in the digital preservation field and it's used in many different ways by different professionals. Here's some examples. Digital archiving. So information professionals like librarians and archivists, they often use this term to include digital preservation processes. 
So a digital archivist might do everything from liaising with donors of digital materials, surveying the materials, creating processing plans for the materials. Sometimes they have to establish control over removable media. They might have to create checksums, do virus checks, determine what level of description to assign for digital materials. They might have to identify sensitive content, copyright content. They have to record technical metadata, preservation metadata. They might have to normalize files. They have to ensure that digital materials are packaged with the metadata that makes them understandable and usable over time. And they have to maintain finding aids and catalog records so that users can find the materials. Sounds like a cool job, huh? It's pretty busy. But I've heard the term digital archiving used as well to mean backup and to mean regular maintenance of files without necessarily including all of the curatorial work and all of the digital preservation strategies that, that need to be put in place for the digital assets. So using this example, when you have those two very different definitions and terms, it can sometimes cause issues when you're trying to develop strategies for dealing with them as a unified workforce within an organization. We also hear this term digital curation a lot. So a common definition for digital curation is that it involves active management of digital materials from before they're even created. And it continues throughout the life of the digital materials and it aims to improve reproducibility and reuse. Often, some people use digital curation to incorporate both digital preservation and digital archiving under, under a kind of broader umbrella. So the term digital stewardship can be used as a broader umbrella term, and I'm being literal here with my slide, for, for all of these terms that I've described so far. So digital stewardship can encompass all of the actions and all of the actors, all of the events required to receive, handle, manage, and preserve digital assets, ensuring that authenticity and integrity over time, promoting the reproducibility and reuse through technological change. So if we start to think about all of the actions and all of the actors and all of the events, that fall under this broad group effort called digital stewardship, we start to see the very wide variety of people, a very wide variety of skills are required to participate if we are to effectively preserve our digital assets. So why, why preserve digital materials? We know that digital resources are increasing in scale and complexity across many different domains in research and education, science, cultural heritage areas, in public policy, in government, government in um, businesses. Uh, personal archives are becoming larger and more digital. Many people now capture all of their memories and their work in digital form. And we also know that digital materials are fragile, prone to degradation, prone to loss uh, without active management. Digital preservation is value, be, valuable because its strategies and its actions can help to address the risk of losing access to those digital assets. So this report is the Blue Ribbon Report called Sustainable Economics for a Digital Planet. And it sets out three imperatives for sustainable digital preservation, a compelling value proposition, incentives to act, and well-defined roles and responsibilities. So a compelling value proposition involves being able to assess the value of preserved information so that materials can be selected based on that assessment of value and also being able to communicate that value to all of the stakeholders involved. Of equal importance is providing incentives to act and tailoring those incentives to the communities involved. And it's also really essential to clearly detail the roles and responsibilities involved in preservation. Who does what? So specifying how stakeholders are organized and how the resources flow among them to enable preservation. So having started to think about why we preserve digital materials and a little bit about what's required for sustainable digital preservation, we can see that it's likely to be a bit expensive if we are to do it robustly. It requires a lot of different skills, as I've said, including policy development, curatorial skills, IT skills, Resources are often scarce 
and long-term digital stewardship is beyond the current capacity of many small to medium-sized collection and heritage institutions due to lack of money and lack of adequately skilled people. One measure of good preservation practice is having three or more geographically dispersed copies of all of your preservation materials adequately stored and managed over time. So this redundancy is one key strategy for long-term digital preservation, but even the biggest institutions have trouble scaling their operations to a point where they have this kind of, act, this kind of situation going on. Given that digital preservation requires a lot of ongoing resourcing, many different skills to be successful, it makes sense that working together could be of really great benefit, particularly when thinking about the potential of shared resources, shared skills, shared services. So I would like to share with you two different international collaborative examples that I have come across in the last couple of years to support digital preservation. The first example is an example from Denmark, which details how a network organization is enabling small public archives to do digital preservation. And the second one I'll share is a Dutch approach in constructing a network of nationwide facilities for digital preservation. So a couple of links on the slide here I've shared are by the authors, of, uh, the, the authors who are involved in this network electronic archiving concept. It's one that aims to enable small archives to meet digital preservation mandates through various challenges, such as lack of resourcing, lack of skilled staff in dealing with digital materials. So Network Electronic Archiving is a not-for-profit network organization. It was created back in 2007 and it allows small public archives to take advantage of shared infrastructure, meaning that ingest, archival storage, preservation planning, and management is all handled centrally through the network. Members of the network can draw on a shared group of experts with skills, expertise, and experience in doing digital preservation. And this shared experts group um, includes IT, IT professionals, developers, uh, archivists, and preservation professionals who are, who are skilled in order to cover that wide variety of digital preservation needs. And this works on a consultancy basis. So the staff can help with various aspects, including appraisal, ingest, access considerations. The authors of the first paper here on the slide, the Network Electronic Archiving Concept, uh, they clearly state how this network organization enables digital preservation for those who would otherwise find it really challenging, saying that, quote, running a preservation practice of equal quality, professionalism, and robustness at the same low cost would be impossible without this network organization. The approach has actually proved so beneficial that similar network organizations have sprung up around Denmark, and there's now actually three of them who despite all having very different business models on how they operate, um, they, they do say that they aim to be collaborative, non-competing. I would like to delve into that a little further to find out how that actually works, but that, that's what they claim. So kudos. Okay, so this second collaborative initiative I wanna share is the Dutch approach in constructing a network of nationwide facilities for digital preservation. So the aim of this collaboration work was to search for the best solutions for uh, effective digital preservation on a national level. To guide and support the work, initially a strategic agenda was formed back in 2010, uh, following a national survey. And the agenda aimed to address the issues in the survey. It's got these four themes you can see here, knowledge sharing, development of a scalable and usable infrastructure for long-term information of digital information, cost management, and uh, development of coordination in collection development policies. So the strategic agenda also highlighted the need to create a sense of urgency towards policymakers on all levels that the message is action is needed and it's needed on a national scale. So the all important advocacy and awareness raising. The first priority and focus from the strategic agenda was the second point here on the slide the development of scalable and usable national infrastructure for digital preservation. It was determined that the large heritage institutions in the Netherlands would work out a practical framework, providing a really clear picture of how such an infrastructure could work. 
So firstly, the approach included a research project, which was called Joining Forces for Our Digital Memory, started in 2014, and it was commissioned and financed by their Ministry of Education, Culture and Science. The project work resulted in the model you can see on the slide here, showing all of the pieces required for a robust digital preservation operation. The model includes all of the infrastructure. So infrastructure meaning all of the technology, the hardware, the software, the network infrastructure, all of the specific digital archiving operations that are required, plus all of the organizational elements that enable and govern the technology. So the knowledge required, the policies, the quality control, training and ongoing research and development into best practice. From the model, the research project then conducted extensive interviews with a number of large institutions to get a sense of what their current infrastructure for digital preservation looked like. They discussed current facilities and current services, as well as discussing possibilities to share those facilities and services with other organizations who might not have all of the resources available to cover digital pre preservation across all of these areas. Then they came up with a building IT stack block, if I've got that right. They called it a business IT stack, covering each block, each block here you can see was seen, is seen as a service. So this building block stack is, it's starting to define the elements that could be shared within a collaborative network. They built a catalog of services from this building block model from which a, a, like a list of services can be made available to smaller organizations who are in need of digital preservation. A couple of examples the research project gives of how these shared services could be used in reality. The first one is the Dutch National Archive can offer use of its certified repository to 11 regional historical centers who in turn can then service the smaller archives of things like water authorities and local municipalities. The second example I give is that the Dutch Institute for Sound and Vision can serve as the dedicated repository for audiovisual collections in the Netherlands. What, what I really like about these two collaborative initiatives I've shared with you, so this nationwide Dutch approach and the network electronic archiving for small public archives are that they're really tangible examples of people recognizing the various challenges in digital preservation and mobilizing to actually take action to meet the challenges on big scales. And both of them have a clear focus of this digital preservation for everyone, not just for the biggest well-resourced institutions, but finding ways to support those who don't have the means or ability to fully support preservation of their digital assets. Collaboration, I think, is one of the most important strategies that we can use to improve the way that we do digital preservation for everyone. Which brings me to new stakeholders. The digital world, it offers lots of opportunities for empowering new stakeholders to contribute to long-term preservation. Uh, so cultural heritage and scholarly institutions have long held this mandate or professional obligation to preserve the cultural and scholarly record through time for future generations. The emergence of the digital cultural record hasn't changed this obligation, but it has changed how we can approach the preservation of these materials. So thinking about the post-custodial theory of archives and the digital cultural record, this theory maintains the idea that archivists will no longer physically acquire and maintain records, but that they will provide management oversight for records that will remain in the custody of the record creators. A post-custodial approach, uh, it includes collaboration and continuing relationships between content creators and archivists, but in practice, it can be really difficult to achieve. I think that cultural heritage and scholarly institutions now have an obligation to find more ways to bring in new stakeholders to this business of receiving, managing, preserving digital materials. I think we need to ask ourselves some questions. How do we as professionals, as curatorial professionals, librarians and archivists, and as IT professionals, share our knowledge to empower a wider portion of the community to take actions to preserve their own legacies for the future, and how do we learn? How do we learn from these diverse communities creating and maintaining their own archives so that we can understand how to make better decisions about how we ethically collect and preserve materials? Some examples that are 
tackling these kinds of questions. The Documenting the Now project, has anyone heard of this project in my room? Ross, of course. <laughs> So this was, this was developed originally as a response to the vast social media content generated in relation to the killing of Michael Brown by a police officer in 2014 in Ferguson, Missouri. I've shared a link to an article down the bottom called Preservation Acts Towards an Ethical Archive of the Web. This describes how documenting the now was born. So the project director, Bur Burgess Jules, he was an archivist at the University of California at the time. And he realized that some of the best reporting of the aftermath was coming out of Twitter. It was coming, it was being produced by activists on Twitter. So he wanted to start saving these tweets, but he wasn't sure exactly how to go about it. The following week, he went to a Society of American Archivists conference in Washington, DC. And on his way to drinks at the hotel bar, he started talking about the situation and talking about his ideas. His talk happened to be overheard by Ed Summers who is the developer of a Twitter archiving tool, who then went about harvesting all of the Ferguson tweets. And within two weeks, they had over 13 million tweets. So that there have been many powerful stories shared via social media during protests and various events. And this human rights documentation is coming from a huge variety of different voices now. It's also considered highly valuable for future research and scholarship. But there's so many challenges in how we go about collecting it and preserving it and providing adequate context for it and making it available for others to see and to use. Social media, it's, it's become an enabler for marginalized communities and activists, allowing them to take a leading role in shaping the narrative of events as they unfold, particularly protest movements. And it allows them opportunities to manage, capture and preserve their own histories in their own ways. So documenting the now works to support community-based archives, including holding workshops between social media activists and archivists. And the workshops aim to teach activists strategies to manage their own archives, how to capture and store the stuff and how to preserve it. This, this is one really great example of giving new stakeholders the knowledge and the tools to shape their own narrative around how their stories are collected and preserved. And it also gives archivists new ways of thinking about how to ethically collect and preserve community heritage by directly engaging with the content creators. There's also a lot of resources and guides for empowering people in new communities, um, new to the concept of preserving assets over time. And Gerald mentioned a couple of great examples already, but here's, here's a few more. The Artists Studio Archives, Guide to Managing Personal, personal Collections and Creative Legacies, this has almost 100 pages of really in-depth guidance for artists and for their assistants and for others attempting to manage and preserve an artist's personal studio archives. It's really realistic. It's based on real life scenarios and current best practice in archiving and preservation. What I really like about this guide is the time that it spends diving into the reasoning behind why it's important to invest time and energy into creating and maintaining personal legacies. And it speaks directly to the audience of artists and takes them through steps to identify what, like why they are getting organized with their digital archives. There's also an emphasis on moving forward in small steps of preservation using a smart framework. So specific, manageable, attainable, realistic, and time-based. This one's also aimed at artists of all disciplines and career stages, but it's an app. The Art360 Foundation created this free app it's designed to educate about the importance of archiving. Again, it was developed uh, in collaboration with artists and artists' estates and with archivists and digital specialists. Again, really easily accessible guidance is, is provided through this app and helps to educate about the fact that looking after your assets involves time, investment and planning. But it does this in a way that encourages making small bits of time available in your everyday life to do it. It is, it's interesting to think about how encouraging new voices to emerge in the historical record through avenues like this potentially enhances the more traditional custodial approach where institutions accept and curate archival collections with little to no input from the content creators. Just a few more examples. The Activist's Guide to Archiving video. This is produced by Witness, which is a global human rights organization. And it's aimed at human rights activists and media collectives 
who are trying to document human rights issues through digital video. There's lots of guidance available on personal digital archiving, including the National and State Libraries, Australia Personal Digital Archive Toolkit, the Indigitization Toolkit. This is a reference document with a series of templates and it's aiming to help digitization projects that are focused on First Nations knowledge in British Columbia. So it's got guidance on best practice for digitization, including the digital preservation considerations. And finally, Dorothea Salo has created a guide to building portable audio, video, and data rescue kits for community-based resources. It's a good starting point. To wrap up, just a couple of useful things that I'd like to share for getting started with digital preservation. I'm sharing this thought by John Sheridan, who's the digital director at the National Archives in the UK, because there is some great advice in this. John says that a good starting point for doing digital preservation is to focus on understanding and mitigating digital preservation risks. He reiterates that there is no perfect way to do digital preservation. There is no universal standard for this work. And the extra cheery bit to remember is that doing something is always better than doing nothing when it comes to preserving digital materials. A, a really significant part of my work at the University of Melbourne over the last two and a half years that I've been there has been devoted to contributing to building business cases. So we need business cases for various bits of implementation work uh, that are required by the university's 10-year strategy for digital preservation. It's one thing to have a 10-year strategy for digital preservation, and it's quite another to find the money to implement and keep that strategy going. So this digital preservation business case toolkit, it's a really comprehensive guide. It helps practitioners and managers to build business cases to fund digital preservation activities. It has a really high level step-by-step -step guide to follow to create a business case and key questions to consider for your organizational context. It can help to clarify and define why you do digital preservation, assess your budget restrictions, helps to assess your current digital collections, the stuff you have, the formats you have, who supplies your content, who uses your content, helps to define and assess your current capacity to support digital preservation, which in turn can help you define specific and measurable goals over the short, medium and long term. So a short term goal could be just ensuring that all of your digital objects have useful metadata, whereas a long term goal could involve having a dedicated digital preservation policy and a strategy or having a goal to become a trusted digital repository over time. The NDSA level of preservations, finally, this is a good starting point for assessing your digital preservation capability as well. These are tiered recommendations. So at the top covered there is level one, level two, level three, level four. So these tiers build incrementally across a range of different areas, storage and geographic location, file fixity and data integrity, information security, metadata, and file formats. It is important to be aware that this matrix doesn't cover things like policies, staffing, or organizational support and funding. It covers the more technical elements of preservation infrastructure so that you can use other maturity models in conjunction with these levels to assess all of the broader requirements for sustainable digital preservation. And on that note, I'll thank you for your patience, time, and, and listening. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Um, we're going to take a short break, and uh, that includes our online visitors. Uh, could we try and be back here in 15 minutes or so at 25 past? Um, we're running slightly ahead of time, much to our surprise. So uh, there is a small amount of leeway. The nearest cappuccino machine is at the National Museum. So if anyone is desperate, it's a short run and they're, not, and they're quite good. Otherwise, there's tea and co coffee outside. Thank you very much.
Just for I was going to Welcome back, everyone. Um, we're going to progress through this next session. And at the end of it, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions of any of the presenters or indeed have a general conversation within the room with all of us. So a slightly different format than you may have seen before. We're also going to include um, responses from those who are participating in the online uh, webinar. Dr. Ross Harvey is an adjunct professor at Monash University, having previously held academic positions at universities in Australia, Singapore and the United States. Um, his research interests focus on the stewardship of digital materials in libraries and archives, and particularly on their preservation. Um, and that's the materials, not the libraries and archives. The uh, most recent book is the third edition of Preserving Digital Materials, published this year with Jane, and Digital Curation with Gillian Oliver in 2016. Ross will talk about how digital preservation, as it is currently constituted, really only tinkers around the outside edges 
of uh, the issue and he'll critique the uh, state of digital preservation as it exists at the moment. So after we've had this slight uplifting conversation about the experiences in Denmark, where I actually went to college, um, so I understand the idea of not bothering with competitiveness. Uh, they just don't think that way. Um, we will sort of sit back, put our seatbelts on and listen to the critique. Welcome, Ross. <laughs> Um, I think it, it's been oversold a bit, what I'm about to say just there, but uh, we'll see. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the uh, people of the Ngunnawal Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present. So what I'm talking about uh, today is an extension of the theme of digital preservation for everyone. I'm going to... Um, dwell on the current state of digital preservation and explore some of the ways in which I think we can expand it to make it more applicable beyond its current uh, environment and, and to make it more effective. Uh, before I do that though, I would like to acknowledge Arnett's support in making my attendance, <coughs> excuse me, today possible. And a word of warning, um, you just, um, you just saw it. I'm not used to speaking anymore, I discover, in a fairly solitary um, life. I don't teach classes anymore, and my voice will give out at some stage, so there'll be some coughs. Apologies. I want to start with a definition leading on from Jay. Um, by the term digital preservation, I do mean how to manage material in digital form for use in the future. It's, it's as simple as that. I'm not concerned with how the material became digital, although that's a massive major uh, field and set of issues, as we heard earlier. Um, but just with something that is digital, what happens next? How to keep it? Um, the exciting new ideas in digital preservation don't come from those of us who have been around a long time. They come from people new to the field, who bring new ways of thinking, uh, who challenge the received wisdom, who are brave enough to experiment. And just looking at the people in the room, I can see quite a few of you who are much younger than I am and will continue to challenge and exper experiment, I hope. Uh, Jay has set the scene for this. She's posed some questions, which I will extend um, and hopefully a discussion will be started about what I'm about to say somewhere and sometime. It's been suggested to me that this could be subtitled a provocation. Um, maybe, but we will see. A gentle provocation, don't worry. <laughs> okay, now. What am I doing here? Right. Um, what I can do, though, um, apart from having new ideas challenging the received wisdom and being young enough to experiment, what I can do is point out the new directions we are heading in. And I'll do this by addressing five questions. The first one, have we been doing digital preservation wrong? Current practice is too overwhelming, perhaps even threatening for many of us. Um, and I will hope to demonstrate that a little later. Two, what's wrong with what we are doing? Current practice, in my view, focuses on how big organizations do digital preservation. Uh, it takes little account of the realities of most organizations, particularly in terms of resourcing, but also in, in access to appropriate infrastructure, um, ability to argue with IT, <coughs> IT people um, to get what you want, all sorts of reasons like this. You know, we're not all the National Library who has an IT department that is well attuned to preservation issues, comparatively. I'm looking at a member of the National Library staff here, or three of them actually, <laughs> who knows. Um, three. 
what questions do we need to ask? And th this presentation is all about questions. There'll be long lists of questions. And again, another apology, I don't think very visually, so you're gonna get lots of words uh, on screen, okay? And the questions we need to ask are aimed at making digital preservation more appropriate to a wider range of participants. And we need to rethink it to pose some basic questions again. The fourth one, what does a rethink mean? Um, the implications include the need for simplification and for not aiming at being perfect. And that's something I'm going to dwell on a bit. I think we've been a bit hung up on perfect preservation. And number five, how might we take on board these new concepts? And I will talk, uh, uh, mention some of the starting points that I think will be useful for this. My comments are in large part based on a survey of digital preservation activities carried out when preparing with Jay the third edition of Preserving Digital Materials. Um, they've also been informed by presentations and discussions at a symposium in Canberra earlier this year, Lost in the Cloud, and also by Libor Kufel's review of it at the October Australasia Preserves meeting. Thank you. Um, very helpful. Um, this, of course, is shameless advertising and self-promotion. I want to read out more often. You buy the book and the royalties will eventually come to us. There you go. Um, I don't have copies with me, sorry. <laughs> okay, so looking at the first question, have we been doing digital preservation wrong? It's come a long way since it was first thought about seriously, which seems to have been in the 1960s. I think there's a little piece of research there in itself to see when the term first started being used and what it was, how it was conceived. Um, this field is maturing, but it's not yet mature. It's got its own standards, theories, processes, and ways of thinking. And these are generally accepted by the digital preservation community. And after many years, I have great difficulty in pronouncing publicly the word digital. <laughs> I can't do it. So I may just switch to DP for digital preservation. It's much easier. Uh, there's plenty of evidence for the statement that digital preservation is maturing. There, there's, uh, there are lots of standards, for example. There's a lot of people now working in the field throughout the world, quite a lot of resources are being committed to it. It's got its own uh, standards, as I said, and its own set of acronyms, OAIS, Premise, METS, PAMIS, all sorts of things. Um, and if you read some of the literature, it's acronym rich and quite dense. For the first time, I think, it's possible to purchase effective digital preservation systems that have been developed through collaboration between the vendors and the customers. And this, this is something I think is quite exciting, if you have enough money, that is. Uh, in Australia, the large national heritage organizations, the National Library, National Archives, National Film and Sound Archive, have been working for many years at the leading edge of digital preservation. Um, Jay and I have written in our book, another plug, by the copy, um, about how the field has changed since 2005. So there's a really good summary there, in my view. <laughs> I might be biased. The 2018 IPRES conference was interesting because it featured sessions on taking stock after 15 years of these conferences, how the field has changed, how it is maturing. However, the increase in attention and resources devoted to digital preservation is addressing only a tiny proportion of the quantities of material we would like to preserve. I think it's impossible to envisage a situation where current approaches to digital preservation, current ways of thinking can ever be scaled up to anywhere near enough to preserve the quantities we think we should. And that I think is the big issue, the challenge that we have to figure out how to have more throughput in the di digital preservation process. At this point, many of us give up. Current practice is too overwhelming, overwhelming, perhaps even threatening. 
we don't know where to start. The challenge is simply to pray it. Now, I'm aware that some of you in the room will understand this diagram and have spent a lot of time thinking about it, but most of us don't. And if you start off looking at something like that, it's just way too overwhelming. Um, but instead of letting all this get on top of us, I suggest that we have to ask the question, maybe we are doing digital preservation wrong. Uh, a better approach is to look at how we currently do it and interrogate it to see if there are better ways to achieve the results we want. So here's the first of a long list of words. Uh, what's wrong with what we are doing? I think, briefly stated, that current practice emphasizes and has been developed by how big organizations do the digital preservation. And it doesn't take any account or hardly any account of how smaller organizations might approach this or of the, their realities. Hand in hand with maturity and digital preservation comes the experience to reflect. So I argue that we need to go back to the basics. What is digital preservation? What is it for? Um, who are we doing it for? What do they want it to do? And I suggest that we haven't actually asked our users, although it's a bit difficult sometimes because they're in the future, um, but we haven't thought anywhere near hard enough about what they might want. There are other questions to be addressed, and I've got some of them up there. Who is doing it at present? How do we bring in more diversity? And just looking at this audience, um, there is a certain characteristic I can see of all of us, pretty much, um, certain backgrounds. We, we, we don't have a representative range of people working in the field. Nowhere near it. How can we advocate for it better? This is a big challenge because we haven't really done this very well. Now we need to ask these basic questions because, as I said before, current practice isn't working. It's not scalable upwards. It just will never handle the kind of quantities that we want it to handle. Major change, I think, is, is required. But what, excuse me, what kind of change, what might it look like? Uh, I think we need a major mindset change in digital preservation. We have to move to a situation where all people who create data are the primary actors in it, not just the big organizations who tend to focus on it now. And furthermore, we have to try and empower all of the people who create data to take preservation action, and we're a very long way from that. Uh, digital preservation has developed some bad habits as it has matured, and I want to talk about two of them. Uh, here's one of them, validation. We automatically think we have to apply validation and file format identification. Um, there's been quite a lot of um, debate on some of the blogs in the last year or two about this, uh, by the way. Uh, it's standard practice and it's time consuming and quite difficult sometimes, but its value is currently being challenged. Is it a waste of time? I think that's a question that has to be seriously discussed. Another bad habit is format obsolescence. Um, this is based on the idea that file formats will become unreadable, so we must ensure before they become inaccessible that they are changed to formats that, that are readable. And so we expend large quantities of effort and resources on migration, for example, which is a just-in-case scenario. It's putting a lot of effort, time, money into a situation that it hasn't really been proven to be the case. And there's a lot of literature about this, especially a guy called David Rosenthal, um, who's been writing, in my view, some very powerful and convincing material for a long time now about this. Um, we have the means, well, we have a different situation from when digital preservation first thought that format obsolescence was a great threat. 
in the 1980s, maybe 90s. It has changed. We have other factors and they minimize the threat. And I put some words up there by Glenn Dingwell about some of the reasons why format obsolescence is not as great a threat as we thought it was. Um, we continue to base much of our, our practice on addressing the risks posed by format obsolescence, but this needs to change, or at least we need to investigate it very thoroughly. Um, what questions, this is my third area of discussion, what questions do we need to ask to get digital preservation working better? Um, I think we have to go back to basics. The first urgent question in my view is who is digital preservation for? Who are we actually doing it for? If we can answer this better, it affects a lot of what we aim at and aim to do. Uh, some organizations have a very specific remit and so it's easy enough for them to decide who it's for, but many, maybe most organizations and groups of people who want to preserve materials don't quite know what they are doing, except in a general sense of, we want to keep this for the future. If we can answer this a lot better, I think we will be way better off. Too often though, the practices we read about and observe are developed for and applied in large organizations. And our challenge is to translate these current practices into practices that work for a much wider range of players including individuals. So I think that's one reason why asking the basic questions is imperative. We really have to do that. Um, the possible list of questions, this is a long list, and sorry about that, um, and there's more coming up. Um, the possible list of questions we might need to start asking look something like this. First, who is digital preservation for? We need to rethink who it's for. Uh, what about the smaller organizations and individuals? We haven't really addressed their needs or offered them the tools to let them do it themselves. Or, this is my favorite um, scenario at the moment, built computer systems, built operating systems that let them automatically preserve at the push of a button. Um, I think it's feasible, but uh, it's obviously very hard to convince people who develop major operating systems for computers to embrace that. There are signs that it's starting to be thought about, by the way. So I've listed some of the specific questions under each of these headings. The second one, who should do digital preservation? I think, well, we need to rethink who it's for. Many new stakeholders are engaging with it, as Jay has pointed out, and their practices have the potential to change how we think about digital preservation. We're not taking enough notice of how other people are doing this. And the third point, what does it mean to say a digital object is preserved? And this is possibly the, one of the really big questions. Um, what constitutes adequate preservation? Notice I say adequate, not perfect here, because I think we, I'm saying I think a lot, just, just assume it's the case. Uh, our current understanding of best practice is unrealistic and unaffordable. Do we have to render the object perfectly in the future? Can we continue to maintain the high standards we currently aspire to? How realistic is the OAIS reference model, which was developed by the space data community, who has, and certainly had, lots of money, lots and lots and lots of money, massive amounts, and needed to be perfect, because if you're a, an astronaut orbiting up there and your computer fails or the system fails, you're in real trouble. So they need to be perfect. Do we need that level of perfection? Do we need to more fully embrace parsimonious preservation? This is a, a great um, concept by a guy called Tim Gollins, who was in um, Canberra recently. 
and he obviously likes alliteration massively, big fan of it. Um, but he talks about a series of small, simple and affordable steps that can be taken by institutions to ensure the long-term survival of vital digital data. He advocates not looking for solutions to problems for which evidence is absent, like format obsolescence, and using only the minimum necessary intervention to secure our digital heritage for the future. And he, this approach emphasizes two things. Um, the imminent threats of poor capture, you have to get the stuff, basically, get hold of it, and the importance of storage in a safe and secure way. And he puts big emphasis on storage. So I highly recommend this paper. It, it is, in my view, a great read, not just a good read, and it's quite short, which is good news as well. So we have other questions. This is one I think is important. How can we advocate for digital preservation better? better? I think we've failed in that respect. We um, haven't persuaded our financial masters, by and large, to give us sufficient money. Um, as a society, as Western society even, we have failed. Maybe small, small po pockets where we haven't failed, but by and large, we are failing in my view. So if we can get a better sense of what some of the answers to these questions are, I think we are going to be better equipped to move forward and develop more realistic practices for a much larger quantity of digital materials, engaging many more people in the process as well. So my fourth of five points, what does a rethink mean? for digital preservation, it means pretty major changes. It will result in a different look for digital preservation. And I'm not talking about next year or in five years time, I think I'm talking about a generational change, at least. So first of all, more people will be players in this, not just the IT focused or IM focused people that currently inhabit that space. Uh, we know already there's a much larger digital preservation network than just the, the big organizations. I mean, we're sitting here at the location of one of them, I suppose. These new stakeholders need to be identified, courted, and given the tools to work effectively. And the long-term aim is to empower all data creators to be primary actors in digital preservation. Just to think, when they create something, to automatically think, how can I make this preservable? A nice fantasy, but hey, <laughs> there we are. Um, the places need to change. I think Jay has talked already about some of the ways in which um, this is changing the activist organizations, for example. The need to be, there needs to be major changes in what we are aiming at. Just what is digital preservation. We don't need the perfect versions. Um, as Craig Ritchie asked at the Lost in the Cloud Symposium, does authenticity even matter? It's a really good question. And I think we need to think about that quite hard. Uh, as he asks, how do we move from our current ideology of fixity and preservation to allow in local contextually specific digital curation practices in the wild? I love that term, in the wild. It's all out there. People are doing it. We haven't captured it somehow and used it, focused. There are lots of actions we can take, and I'm going to talk about some of these in just a moment, but the situation I have in mind is one where the first thought of everyone who creates digital materials is how do I make this preservable? Where preservation is built into digital materials at the point of creation. It's not something added after the fact. Um, how do we start to take on board these new concepts? And this is my final set of points. There are many ways to do this. A key message is to start. Uh, as Jay said, and she was 
I think using John Sheridan's words, the good news is that doing something is way less risky than inaction. So do something. Um, there's a lot of experience out there. Uh, Paul Wheatley has written, among many other people, uh, Paul Wheatley has distilled his extensive digital preservation practice into five points. And um, you can see that they uh, involve collaboration. Um, we can recognize that easily. And also creating <coughs> digital preservation friendly materials. I think though that there are four areas we can start with right now. Um, as soon as you leave the building, you will start thinking about these, I know. Um, engage with new stakeholders and promote collaboration. The first two, Jay mentioned some uh, examples of this. Um, two models, these are, in my view, really critical. And um, Gerald gave some examples of how AATSIS is collaborating as well um, with other groups. But the third one, we're not, I think, doing enough about yet. We need to influence those who create digital objects so they apply appropriate standards when creating the, the things. The goal is to make preservation something baked into digital materials. Hey, there's a cake reference. Something baked into digital materials rather than something added after the fact. Uh, this is going to make our lives much easier if, if we can somehow do this. Number four, how little is enough? We have to ask that question. In fact, I wonder if I would phrase that a bit differently as what is the minimum we can get away with? Um, not, which is a slightly different take on this, but I think we're doing way too much. Uh, the archives world had a revelation a few years ago uh, and figured out that it could adopt an approach to, um, to managing, to uh, processing its materials by looking differently at it and, and lowering its standards, basically, and getting a lot more throughput. And some of the archivists in the audience can help me out because I have just failed to recall what that's called. More process. There's more product, this process, or is it the other way around? Yeah, and I think that that way of thinking is actually really important to us to think about. Um, and I love this quote, thank you, Ibo, um, because we tend to do away way more than we need to often if we don't understand the situation very much. So finally, um, to summarize the points I've made, I, I put those three comments there, and I know that you all are used to reading things, so I won't read them out. But what they are basically saying is we have to change our thinking, otherwise we're going to sink. If we want to keep swimming and getting ahead, we're going to have to reconfigure this field we work in. But I have some final reflections, uh, two of them. One is, although digital preservation is maturing, it seems to me that we're still talking about the same issues as we have been for years now. And we, we really have to move on or move somewhere else because it's not working. And the second final reflection is that the big national cultural heritage organizations are very focused on making what they do in digital preservation work for them. This is totally understandable and as it should be. I, I'm not challenging that. But it probably means that the rest of us who don't work in these libraries, archives, museums, whatever, need to develop aims, goals, and processes that work for us. And they may not be the same. So thank you for listening and um, I'm very happy as the other speakers are, I think, to entertain questions or participate in what Jay is about to show us. Yeah? Thank you. Oops. Did I? 
Who's Adam here? Did I accidentally do something there? The screen sharing? Oops. Yeah, I'm a digital person. I know how to work a computer. Yeah, when you browse, huh? Yeah. No, I just, like, I got a message that I'd stopped the screen sharing. I was just making sure that was all cool. So. Uh, yeah. Cool. Okay, so how does everyone have a device, like a mobile device, uh, like a phone or a computer? Do most people in the room? Can I, like a show of hands, who's got one? Okay, great. Let's give this a go then. So just to start the discussion, I thought we could tackle this question together. So if you can navigate in a browser to this address, www.menti.com, and it'll prompt you to enter a code, which is there on the screen as well, 826257. And have a think about this question. What, what are the biggest challenges for doing digital preservation? The fun thing is we get to see all of the comments pop up on the screen anonymously. So feel free to say whatever you like in this forum. That goes for you people watching on the live stream too. We're expecting your participation. Okay. Which one is it? Should be. So I discover I've been delegated to comment on this as, as uh, we keep posting our, our uh, responses. Let me first of all get the mouse to work. I am. <laughs> Look, <laughs> nothing's happening. Arrow at the bottom. Oh, thank you. Yes, very good. I should know about this, although I cannot pronounce digital, as you discovered. Um, so money is obviously coming up there, resources, I suppose we can generally say, and I assume that means that a lack of them, because I haven't heard of anyone with too much of it lately, at least. Um, help me, please. <laughs> I'll scroll oh, through and you can comment. Yeah. There you go. Let's let's do a dual act. Okay, money. So money is um, and resources. Now I like this one aligning with other areas in the organisation on the same objective, um, and that that's a kind of subset of collaboration. Talking more, finding out who's doing what, and bringing them together um, to figure out some. Um, some common goals and aims. Finance money comes up again, funding, resources. It's complex at the moment, knowing where to start. These, these are perhaps related. Um, we are not somehow getting the message across about how to start and where to start. There are some very easy steps that can be taken, but clearly it hasn't come through particularly. Uh, read our book. It's really good. It will help you. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, institutional buy-in. That, that one is really interesting to me because, uh, you know, we, I'm a librarian by background and training. I 
tend to sit and do things I know about and um, not want to engage with the rest of the organization or the world even sometimes. We well, have to change that mindset and it looks like it's still prevalent. Lack of suitable repositories, uh, absolutely. We need something out there where most people can feel free to uh, submit their stuff to. I'm lucky, I'm an academic still. I've got several choices here for storage, including large quantities of storage, but I'm not totally convinced yet that I have access to storage um, which will keep that stuff for a very long term. So we need more work to be done on that. I like that mindset one as well. I make it, can you preserve it? That's totally back to front. We have to say, you make it this way without, without being heavy handed. Um, I have never, for example, understood why the National Archives does not simply require people who create government records, which will, it will end up with eventually, to follow certain standards. It encourages it, it does not require it, is my understanding. It has the legislative ability. My knowledge is a bit old here, but I think um, it can require it. We haven't done enough of emphasizing this need to make preservable material. The title, ah, interesting. So I suppose that one means digital preservation is the problem, the term is the problem, it needs to be called something else. Did any of you post that by any chance and are willing to admit it? Is that what you meant? Yeah, okay. So digital preservation, the term is a problem. What else might we call it? Any offers? Okay, I've seen sustainability um, in a kind of business context is often used, but you know, yeah. So there's a challenge for the audience, both here and online. Um, what might we call the field to make it more accessible, more likely to succeed? So some themes here, um, lack of suitable repositories, lack of money funding. We haven't convinced people. Uh, we haven't got buy-in. And the, the whole title one was something, the, the field is not perceived in the way we want it to be. How do I scroll up? Oh, gosh, it works. Um, was that an adequate? Summary, what do you think? That was an excellent summary. I guess we should open for questions. Does anyone want to ask questions? And Gerald, you should come up too. Have you got a microphone back there, Fiona? Oh, great. Um, I want to ask you something, Ross. Um, you begin, when, it, when you began, you said you thought a lot of effort to date has been non-scalable. But it seemed to me like you then said, well, we need to start doing things small. So how is, so are you saying that the steps that, you know, in terms of going back to the beginning and just taking discrete manageable steps, does, how does that make things more scalable? Oh, that's an excellent question. <laughs> and it could be a quite a long answer. Uh, let me think about that. Um, at present, how digital preservation is conceived and practiced is limited by technical issues, like how fast you can transfer data. Uh, if any of you know better, please correct me. Um, um, so how much can you store? How many instances of the storage do you need? How much is all that going to cost? Um, how much metadata do you need to keep a perfect item renderable into the future? But if we, if, and so uh, these are, this is the way it's practiced by larger, better resourced organizations. And I'm not dumping on the National Library and the National Library doesn't like what I've said or think, thinks I'm wrong. I'm not dumping on National Archives or 
whoever, because this is also happening in many other contexts, like well-funded businesses. Um, and quite a lot of it's happening and we never discover it because they don't want people knowing what they're doing. There's a lot of money tied up in preserving assets. Um, film, you know, Disney, is a massive organization. Got a lot of money tied up in digital preser in preservation generally. Um, but coming back to the smaller organizations, if more of us do it, then it is automatically scalable because we are handling larger quantities of material. So it's not how much a single organization can handle, but how much in total is being preserved. Cool, that was a long-winded answer. Yeah. I think you'd like to add to it, if I may. Um, I think that it's a almost seeming paradox. Um, I think that... Um, I think that it's only a seeming paradox. I think that if um, um, the solution is that we are trying to do too much, I think that's what Ross is saying, and that's actually what's making it overwhelming and even difficult to start and requires all, or creates all the problems with funding. So I, I've never heard about anyone who would actually come and say, we have enough money, we have enough resources. Uh, I don't know if you have, and I doubt that in my lifetime I will meet a person that will say that. I think it's impossible. So I think that's given and we, we should stop whinging about that pretty much. Um, nobody will ever have all the money that they need. Um, so it's, it's more about how we prioritize and how we deal with it. And so going back to the basics and basically saying what is the minimum that we need to do and what are the simplest steps we can take with all the resource limitations we have actually deals away with that paradox basically. And um, instead of trying to do a perfect job and do everything and be so overwhelmed by that that we don't even start doing anything, if we actually go and, and start taking the small baby steps that we can, then we can deal with it better, I think. So as um, before, Libor has succinctly um, stated what I was trying to say. Thank you. <laughs> I might respond to that one also. Um, one of the phrases that came to my mind, uh, although I didn't use it earlier, was what I would call near enough digitization. And it's a similar concept in that you know, on occasion, uh, it will be uh, the right thing to do to digitize more material at a lower quality because it means that you've got enough time to do it, to get it done, and it is preserved in some usable format. And, and that's, a, that's a similar uh, parallel for that. The, the other thing I would say about it also is that um, one of the things that uh, I saw over at the museum last year, where they had a group of... Um, visiting Buddhist monks who spent, uh, I think it was last year or the year before, spent quite some time making a beautiful sand mandala. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with these, but the, the emphasis is, is, is on the creation of the item and that uh, it's something that people are involved in and take care in and other people observe. But in, at the end of it, it is delicately swept up and destroyed. And, uh, um, I would also say that sometimes it's, it's not the right thing to keep everything. Some things are meant to be lived experiences. They're not meant to be digitized or preserved. And nor should we try. And you make a rod for your own back if you imagine that you're going to do that. Sorry. Thank you. Hi, it's uh, Andrew from Damn Smart here. And just leading off from that, this is for everybody. Um, the idea of forgetting is uh, is an interesting thing and within digital preservation and what we've been talking about haven't really been talking about is there room to leave digital information behind because there's such a sheer amount of data out there at the moment and if we were going to be doing something like that what what sort of rules and what sort of um, uh, instructional framework could people work with if there is the idea of being able to forget can I address that quickly? One of the things I've studied in the past a lot is this archival notion of appraisal and, and its practice. And I think we have the answers in that. We just haven't figured out how to implement them appropriately in a 
fast-changing, ever-expanding digital environment. But it might work like this. Um, when the, someone creates a digital file, uh, of course, in durable formats that will be great for us to manage in the future, they will also automatically be required to indicate how long they think that stuff should last. And forever will not be an acceptable answer in, in my view. Um, and this will at least re require people to think more about what they want that material to do and um, how important it might be. And of course, this goes completely against the serendipitous discoveries of new things and knowledge. So th this is a paradox that I think archivists and librarians have worked with for a very long time. So there is some there is uh, quite, quite a lot of theory and quite a bit of practice. And I've just, do I have a minute more? Um, I worked once with a PhD student in the US who was trying to figure out how much of the automatically generated metadata that happens when you create a file, there's a lot of it, by the way, how much of that is useful for appraising the file? And it turns out that a surprising amount of it could potentially be used that way. As far as I know, her work hasn't gone anywhere, but it was most interesting. Okay, um, so a question from Nick Steiberger. As someone from a smaller organization, I, I disagree that the limitations are technical. How can we change mindsets? We have been training data creators in producing archive-ready materials for 15 years in paradigm. DSEC. Uh, we need, yeah, okay, so thanks for that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm an academic, I can talk forever. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, you're coughing now, I think. Um, yeah, I, we just have to keep doing it. I mean, I've, I've been trying to encourage this for a long time as well. I, all, if everyone in this room found 10 people and persuaded them to do this and then <coughs> it, it would snowball, it might escalate. I don't think there's an easy answer. Uh, one, in the academic context, we can get hold of um, research students, PhDs, new PhD students, new staff, and attempt to persuade them that they, are, they often have minds of their own. Um, but at least we can make those attempts. I could, I could maybe, I just had come to my mind, um, it's an academic context, but from the research data world, again, the Netherlands, I'm bringing up another Netherlands example here. They have what they call a data stewardship program where they, they find money to embed data stewards in each of their faculties. And that embedded person then brings their knowledge and their skills to systematically and kind of through the very embedded nature of that, that person, build relationships and collaborations that enable other people to take on archiving skills. So they're tackling it that way. That's just one example, I guess, of changing mindsets, but it's slow and you have a lot of setbacks and I've experienced this myself and you just have to keep getting yourself up again and going small steps, small steps, one person today, 10 people tomorrow. And the idea of being authentic and um, when it comes to digitising, having this perfect copy, why, do we, why did we want that? Why is that mindset there in the first place? If we understood that, perhaps we could then address it and move forward. I think that's an excellent question to add to my list of questions. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I think that you, Ross, actually already answered that question partially in your talk. And I think that the answer is actually in, um, yes, we need people who bring fresh perspective and we need to have more discussions like this challenge and actually our thinking. And um, it's very, very encouraging actually to see that it's becoming more the norm lately. 
that we've had many of these discussions where we actually say, well, hang on, do we need to go back? You know, is OAI as actually the right thing to follow? Uh, do we have to do, uh, you know, abide by all the standards is actually best practice our friend or enemy? Um, yeah, so I, I think we need open discussions. We need more people like you, Ross, <laughs> who come and actually, you know, he's maybe not um, a practitioner, but comes with certain credentials with a lot of long experience in that field and is, and is kind of like neutral and challenges us to rethink what we are doing. And hopefully with some more um, focused questions that allow discussion to take place because mine, some of mine were shut out questions, you know, and I don't know where you start answering them. Thank you. Could I just ask a question, Ross, um, on obsolescence again? Obsolescence. Um, so, so given that the format obsolescence hasn't really been the issue that might have been predicted some decades ago, just wonder if you have a comment on carrier obsolescence. Um, that, I think that's a different matter because that's actually physical obsolescence, and you know, the laws of physics require you know make that happen. Um, so we need to understand very carefully, very well the makeup of the carriers. The, nothing I'm saying here is new. This is very well understood in the audiovisual archiving field, for example. Um, we need to know the makeup of the characters, their chemical and physical makeup, and how long they might last and the optimum uh, storage conditions and handling conditions. So I don't think any of that has changed. It's the file format obsolescence that is where we are seeing that the threats are not nearly as much as we first thought. And we are also seeing some really useful and practical approaches to how to manage that. Okay. Thanks, Ross. I think I've just realised I probably should have said container rather than carrier. Um, I'm thinking of diskettes and things that we can't read because we don't have the machines to do them. Yeah, anymore. so I think my first comment would still apply to those. If we can't read them, but we somehow think there might be something on there, on them, we'll have to work hard to figure out what's on them. And again, there's a whole set of techniques. Um, digital forensics works with this a lot. Um, but I would personally ask the question first, if we don't know what's on it, why are we keeping it? Anyway, that's me. Sorry. Um, I guess my question kind of relates back to the question that, the, that was just asked. Um, and when your comment, uh, Ross, about moving away from fixity and such things into local contextual, um, you know, uh, digital curation practices. Um, excuse me if I got it wrong, but it, you need to know what is the content and be able to access the content before you can, you know, curate such things. Um, and we've had here at IATSIS, um, you know, some audio items from years ago that uh, came from old Macintosh operating systems. And before we can even tell what's on it, um, you know, we need to be able to, we needed to import that as raw data and be able to play it through our current players. So um, could you just expand a bit more on your comments there about that? Um, I think again, I would refer you to a large body of practice, research and um, processes that uh, go under the umbrella of digital forensics. And you can buy workstations now to assist you in this practice. And I think probably the National Library's got one of them. Has it got a fret? You have similar, yeah, okay. Um, so these allow you to have a much better chance of getting at data on, you know, well, maybe it, that it's not completely unreadable, but trying to figure out what it is and how to, how to get it off the carrier, the container, in a way that makes it able to be worked on further. So that's one area I would um, suggest you look at if you haven't already. But again, that other question, if you really are, if you really find that something is totally inaccessible, you can't read it, 
You have no idea if it's important or not. It just happened to be in the desk that you inherited when you moved into the office. Um, I suggest it's probably not important. You have to make some decisions and some of them will be wrong. And this is one of the lessons I think we haven't taken on board enough yet. Um, particularly with appraisal, you will make wrong decisions. Live with it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I'll ask my question. Can I just thank all three of you for some really stimulating uh, discussion, discussions, papers? Um, I've got two questions. Uh, Ross, I'm really interested in your idea about encouraging creators to use durable formats, and I'm just wondering if you can kind of unpick that a little bit. Um, and then I think this leads on from the last question. So possibly a question for you, Jay, when you're saying, you know, often when we're talking digital preservation, we're talking about a whole series of activities that not only make um, electronic material uh, uh, preserved in its you know, in, in a format that can be accessed in the future, but exactly that problem of it's just as easy with digital, easier with digital formats, I would often argue, to not know what's in them. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about how create, how, what kinds of things creators need to think about when they're creating digital items with a view for preservation beyond simply, you know, putting it on the current version of um, a widespread, a, a widely used uh, electronic format? Um, I'll quickly address the first one. The, there's a, a lot of thinking work and um, understanding about what a long lasting file format is likely to look like. It could be open source, not necessarily, but probably. It could be, it has a very, wide user base, and it's been around for a long time. These are some of the criteria. There are others. So, and here's a really extreme example, which I wouldn't suggest to any of you. You might encourage people to put all of their um, text files in .txt, um, which is, I don't know, I think it's always been readable and it's, it's a very, very simple format, but it has no, it doesn't allow formatting or anything much like that, uh, rather than a Microsoft product, which as we all know, keep changing and not necessarily for the better. What? <laughs> not true. Well, Microsoft has made some major attempts to have open file formats. Um, the argument against Microsoft, uh, for Microsoft, products as being durable is simply the, the user base. There will always be people there who will want to get at them. It took us a long time to realize that, by the way. Um, yeah. Thank you for updating my knowledge. It certainly wasn't always the case. I think that's pretty clear. Um, and also, there are other products that will allow you to open a wider range. And I think of LibreOffice, which I often fall back on rather than hassle with Microsoft. Um, so thank you for that. And I look forward to reading your material on this. That's great. Jay. I reckon we should just give the obsolescence expert a microphone right now. <laughs> uh, OK, so the second part of your question. Uh, so. We, we just talked about the sustainable file formats issue and perhaps one of the great indicators is, of that is being the user base. So your question is also around what other kind of guidelines um, can we give curators to, at the start to make, to make stuff accessible? Am I yeah, interpreting that right? 
and going to the discoverability. You might have a perfectly preserved um, set of files of all kinds of uh, formats um, on a hard disk. Um, that doesn't mean you could know what any of this is. You know, it's, it goes yes, back yeah. to that we have disks that um, we don't yeah. know what's on them. Sure. So I guess I'll, I'll go to my immediate experience again in my academic context, working with researchers and thinking about research data. So they're doing experiments in across a wide range of different disciplines with different methodologies. So if we don't get that information from those people about why did you do the research this way? How do, you, how do I make sense of this spreadsheet that only makes sense to you? All of the metadata around that, hopefully automatically capturing the technical metadata about the instruments that created the stuff. All of that stuff is, is, is of much interest to me to make stuff beyond the file format issue. It's all of that understandability. The curatorial work, which is highly undervalued in my opinion, and that we need to push, to push for. just wanted to say something to that topic as well. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a, a couple of things that sort of go to that point about um, future possibilities for collaboration to Im improve that situation and that also inform the changing of mindsets or the improving of mindsets. And um, obviously, uh, for some people, the move from uh, doing their research in what I might call analog ways into digital ways or digital means of capturing that and collating that and curating that. That's um, sort of an adjunct to whatever the focus of their work is. So I think there's certainly uh, room for, um, I guess, a two way street of communication and collaboration to improve that. I think one of the things that collecting organisations um, have an opportunity to do is that uh, at the point of offer of material to their collections, perhaps there needs to be um, a closer level of thinking about what is the, the limits or what are the requirements or what's the bar, the low bar, the high bar about when materials have enough um, suitable information, system of arrangement so that they represent a, a value that's being offered to the organisation rather than a burden that adds up to already received materials that may be in a state of disarray or lack of information. So uh, I think that goes back to what you said before, Ross, uh, about um, that the NAA have some legislative powers there. Um, but it can just be a, a, a process thing that organisations do at, at point of offer of material. That's one thing. Um, I think the other point on that that I mentioned is that some people, some of you I'm sure are aware, um, uh, IATSIS has um, uh, guidelines for uh, ethical research for those working with Indigenous communities and uh, they're currently uh, under review and um, clearly there's a, there's a lot of information in that about uh, how research is done, what sort of information is collected, who it is available to, under what terms, those sorts of things. And um, I think there's also a, an ethical principle in that material that is collected and created is also in a suitable and useful form. Um, again, not producing a, 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 a whole additional burden of work for the organisation to manage and preserve. Um, I think that's a, a learning curve for, for many people. Um, uh, from, from many sectors involved. Uh, and I, I think um, that will be a continuing mindset change um, that, that will take the work that you know, OS Preserves and others, other groups like it can, can do. Um, at, but I, I think there's a mutual and shared obligation there between collecting organisations, creators, um, to, to, to manage and, and improve that. Um, <clears throat> sorry, back here. Um, just, just following on from, from those comments um, and the notion of being able to sort of uh, bake preservation into the, the creation. Um, and Jay, as, as you know, uh, there's been a lot of effort around uh, research data management 
and what the um, uh, the value is back to the researcher for that, and obviously like um, data publication is is now sort of a uh, of value to them is is sort of a, another sort of um, a checkbox that they they can quote. Uh, what sort of inducements can can be provided uh, to encourage people to to um, uh, follow preservation guidelines in in the creation of their their materials? I don't, you don't have to have a ready answer for no, that, but that's that's a hard interested one, Gavin. to Thank see you. where the thinking is going. <laughs> no, the, uh, I guess you're talking about incentives. I mean. Uh, I shared a couple of examples that particularly the artists guides that I shared um, in my talk, just nailing what what matters to that community. So in, ter in terms of artists, it's about empowering them to have a creative legacy to show for future exhibitions for whatever whatever personal legacy mm -hmm. they want to do that with their work. And for researchers, you're right, it's maybe the impact we have to nail better is publication impact um, and also also personal legacy as well. So you think about a researcher through their career and if they're using primarily digital materials to build that career, they want to have access to that at the end, surely. So work in progress. But, but then how does that apply to the creation of, of cultural materials, not, not artistic or research materials? That's a good question. I would turn to this, this crowd to have that discussion, I think. I'd throw the question back at you. What are the incentives for the cultural and heritage community to, to get this mindset change happening? Join the forum and answer that question. Go nuts. We encourage it. So do we have any concluding comments or thoughts at this stage? Okay. Um, just a concluding thought. Thank you very much for listening. Um, because I think I was quite provocative there, and um, I hope there is an outcome from it. And we're being told to come up and just say thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank you for coming, and thank you for listening.